So today we're going to be focusing on religion and politics, um, maybe more politics leaning, however things go. Um, I think Eric is going to start us off. Eric, go ahead. So uh, just uh, what sort of impact did religion have on your family as a child? Okay. Well, um, I mean, I was between two two religions. One was the Roman Catholic and the other was the Melkite. And, um, uh, you know, I went to, I was baptized and made communion in the Catholic school, in the Catholic church. I went to Catholic, um, they called it confraternity. I took lessons, you know. I went first to public school and then I went to a Catholic school in sixth grade. But, you know, my parents believed in um, religious education. So I went to uh, religion classes after school when I was in the public school. And then, of course, when I went to Catholic school, I, um, you know, le learned religion. It was really part of, um, of our studies. And then I went to Catholic high school and I went to a Catholic college. But I never really felt, although I was very deeply religious, I didn't, I didn't buy into the bureaucracy of Catholicism. And I, I never felt that comfortable um, because Catholicism in Brooklyn was flavored Irish Catholic. And I was not Irish Catholic, and it was very dogmatic, and um, you know, and I could, of course, I had this mother who said, "God is not an accountant, so you think for yourself, and uh, He's not checking off when you eat meat on Friday." And and so, well, I, when I wanted to get married, I didn't want to get married in the Roman Catholic Church. And so my husband and I were married in the Melkite, which is a Syrian church where my parents were, um, were married and uh, where I was confirmed. Uh, I was confirmed in the Melkite church. You know, the seven sacraments, um, one of them is confirmation. But yeah, we weren't a particularly a religious uh, family. I, I remember talking to classmates in my um, elementary school and they would say the rosary together. The family would say the rosary together and I thought, oh my God, that's not us. Uh, <laughs> you know, we, we, I went to church. My parents, you know, made sure that we went to church, but it wasn't, you know, that if you didn't go to church, you were going to go to hell. It wasn't that kind of, and that was my mother's influence. My father, on the other hand, he was deeply religious, and he he what what uh, what motivated his religion was charity, and he was a very charitable person in in the way he 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 dealt with people. He always respected people, whether they were Puerto Ricans or Cubans or Blacks, you know. Uh, whereas, um, you know, so I grew up in that kind of an environment. Um, so you've mentioned sort of the Melkite Church, the Syrian yeah. Melkite Church. Um, I know you grew up sort of um, Roman Catholic, but could you talk more to the differences between the Roman Catholic practices and the Malachite practices? Well, I mean, the, the liturgy was in Arabic and um, it was very ornate. You know, um, when we got married, we, we walked around the, the altar, we had crowns put on our heads and um, the iconography of the church was much more Eastern, you know, um, and it was just a different flavor uh, from, from uh, the Roman Catholic. Um, you know, they, priests could, could marry, 
which I thought was a good idea. Um, in terms of um, religion, I mean, they followed the dictates of the Pope. Uh, the Melkite Church was in union with, the, with uh, Rome, whereas the Orthodox, the Syrian Orthodox Church was, was not. Um, you know, they had their patriarchs who were in, um, in Greece, I think. Uh, so you also mentioned growing up, you've already mentioned Irish Catholic, um, but previously you talked about having a lot of Scandinavian um, yeah. people in sort of where you lived. Could you talk oh, yeah. about their religious practices? Oh. Did you experience those or? Uh, well, well, they were all Protestant. And I remember one summer, um, the Protestant church had a, um, like a summer, summer school or summer camp. And, um, you know, I, uh, my mother sent us to that. Although, you know, in those days as a Catholic, you weren't allowed to even go into a Protestant church. And here I was with my sister, we were going <laughs> into this Protestant church. You know, and it was, it was like fun, uh, Christianity, you know, how they do it for kids. Um, and in fact, my mother, the, she had a very good friend who was Protestant. She was Syrian Protestant. And they, uh, the church would not allow her to be a bridesmaid in her friend's wedding. And my mother... At that time, she didn't, she didn't, you know, uh, participate uh, as a bridesmaid. You know, the Catholic Church has gone through a lot uh, in the 60 years that I am aware of it. Yeah. And of course, you had Pope John the 23rd, who was much less dogmatic. In fact, you know, if if you ate meat on Friday, that was a mortal sin and you're going to go to hell, right? Well, my mother, she said, okay, now that Pope John said it's not a mortal sin, you can eat meat on Friday. She said, what about all those Catholics that are in hell because they ate meat on Friday? I mean, she thought, she thought for herself. Um, so that's the kind of religion. So clearly religion was something that was spoken about at home. Um, was politics talked about frequently? Well, you know, my, my parents and all their relatives, um, well, maybe not all their relatives, were Republicans, okay? And I think that was because they were in business. Um, but, uh, you know... I, I, in college, uh, Kennedy was, um, Kennedy and, and Nixon were the candidates. And because my parents were Republican, I thought, well, you know what, let me, let me see if I can't work. I was only 18, you couldn't vote. Uh, let me see about uh, participating in something Republican, you know. And so I went to a Republican meeting before they had this big rally. And um, they said, okay, well, when we raise our hands, everyone should cheer. <laughs> so I, anyway, I went to the rally. It was at the convention center in New York. And it was, it, it appalled me because what I saw was this mindless cheering there was like there were these cheerleaders in front working up the crowd to to uh, have them all cheer at a certain time and i thought you know what i, I actually had to leave i thought you know this is what mu it must have been like to be in a hitler rally because it was so mindless and so i walked out and um you know, of course, I couldn't vote. But my my brother, who was two years younger than I, uh, he was all for Kennedy. And so, you know, we would talk about the difference between Nixon and Kennedy. And uh, I, I got convinced to be, you know, for Kennedy. And uh, my father, which is so interesting, 
he never voted for a Democrat, but he said he's going to vote for Kennedy because he's Catholic. <laughs> so there you go. Um, you know, and like uncles uh, during the Vietnam War, you know, uh, uncles were all for the Vietnam War. My father, not so much. My mother, no. Uh, and I certainly was not against, was against the war. Really. Did you have my, an opinion on um, the Vietnam War and the protests? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I was against it. And um, Did you see the protests? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I had an infant and, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to any of the protests but uh, I remember getting into arguments with uh, relatives. Uh, but you know, one thing my father used to say that really bugged me, he said, you know, the politicians in government, the people in government, they know something that we don't know. You know, so, you know, I don't know. I have to rely on uh, the experts or the politicians, but uh, pop, you know, he, his life, he worked so hard that he really didn't have time. And he struggled in his business. Both my parents did. And, um, you know, later on when they had more time, they, you know, they became more aware of what was going on in politics. Um, so, and Pop, when he, when he retired, he read the New York Times from cover to cover every day. Um, and mom was always more liberal than my father because she said, God gave you a brain to think, use it. <laughs> so were there differences in sort of who and what political discussions you could have? Um, were there sort of gender dynamics or was it open for everyone? Gender wasn't an issue ever. Um, but, um, on Sundays, a lot of times we go, my sister and I, we would go to my aunt Adele's. She lived a few blocks away and she was the most incredible cook and people would gather at her house. She had four sons and they were a little bit older than I. And on Sundays, when they would get together, the four boys and my uncle Ray and my other cousin Albert, my twin sister and I would, would go there we were in college at the time, and there would be these incredible discussions, people yelling, and some people, and, and a lot of time, well, I had an uncle who was a Republican, and the, uh, the cousins, they weren't, they were very, very liberal, and the topic of discussion was um, busing, and I remember the, the loud <laughs> fights, <laughs> verbal fights um, about, about um, busing. And I know there were other topics of discussion, but no one got angry, no one hated one another. They were making rational uh, uh, arguments. And I loved it to have been a, a participant in this because my sister and I, we were in college and all of these guys, they were sophisticated and you know uh, intellectual and uh, they included us so uh, other than maybe the um sorry the vietnam war and busing were there any sort of specific political events you remember from your childhood no no well discussions about palestine you know what the is the zionists had done because um the, um, my mother had a cousin who lived in Jerusalem and the, uh, Isra the Zionist terrorists, this is before World War II, before people knew about the Holocaust and all this, in the mid thirties, I don't know if it was the Stern Gang or the Haganah or whatever, came into their home and they were very wealthy and they had a beautiful home in Jerusalem and they were given these, these men came in with submachine guns and they were given a half an hour to get out. Okay, people don't know that. And then um, the mother of these four boys, young men, cousins, uh, she, was from, she was from Jaffa uh, and her 
family was kicked off of their land and they went, like a lot of Palestinians, they went to Egypt. Um, and, but then she eventually married and came to the United States. But yeah, we were always aware of what the Zionists and the Israelis were doing to the Palestinians. And um, uh, we all agreed, but um, America didn't agree. So that's what I was going to ask. Were you comfortable talking about um, the Zionists, this conflict outside of their household? Well, I remember in high school, I, I had read um, Exodus, which was really Israeli propaganda, if you ask me. And um, I, I remember discussing it with um, a classmate, and she got so irate. Oh, the, you know, the poor Jews, of course, the poor Jews who were victims of the Holocaust. They need to go there, uh, you know. But what, what was happening to the Palestinians? She could not see that they were being displaced for Europeans to come in and take their land, and um, she wouldn't listen. So I shut up. And I, I, I didn't ever talk about um, Palestine because, um, you know, it was sort of, you were, you were looked upon as anti-Semitic if you did uh, criticize Israel. Um, and it wasn't until 10 years ago that I became active. What I, I did was uh, I met a, a woman who was Palestinian and she and I worked together to give a talk. Oh, it was a friend of mine who asked me to give a talk at St. Luke's about Palestine. And so I worked up um, this whole um, talk with um, a PowerPoint uh, presentation about, you know, what happened to the Palestinians? How, how, did, um, how did the Palestinians become what they are now? Um, and I, I, I go through what, you know, the English owned, controlled Palestine after World War I, and they promised to the Palestinians their own country. But um, there was a lot of, you know, Zionism was very strong in England, and Lord Rothschild got the English to promise that uh, they would give a homeland to the Jews in Palestine. And so you had the Balfour Agreement. Do you know the Balfour Agreement? And what it said was that uh, Jews could settle in, in uh, Palestine as long as they don't uh, uh, displace the people. Well, of course, that that's, didn't happen. And, um, you know, the English were racists, and they were racists against Arabs. They could relate better to Jews. Um, Jews were bankers, um, and and so they 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 treated the Jews who a lot of. If you look at the history of immigration uh, into Palestine, uh, the the British allowed more and more Jews to come into Palestine, and. Um, you know, the Palestinians were getting concerned. I mean, that's, that's history and I'll let you, I'll let you work on it. But, um, you know, I, I would, I gave the history of what happened to the Palestinians up until um, 1948. And then I showed, then I showed how the Palestinians lost more and more land um, until they're, they're settled into these little Bantu stands, you know. Um, and then I gave a, a, another talk at a Mennonite church in Columbus uh, at um, the senior, uh, senior center in Granville and at Kendall. Um, but I, I just gave four talks. Was this, so what was the reaction from Americans to 
Well, I mean, they didn't know it. Oh, oh, I get there. I gave another talk. There is this organization of women in Newark, it's Licking County. And I gave that talk. And it was like I was talking about how to make a hamburger. <laughs> they, it went totally over their head. Um, no one asked a question. These were people from Licking County. And only one person afterward came up to me and said, I agree with you. I, I know what's going on. But these other people could have cared less because, well, they're Arabs. You know, I mean, I'm interpreting it as that. And let's face it, the uh, American press has been much more sympathetic to Israel than to the Palestinians. In fact, after World War II, when, um, oh, during World War II, uh, let's see, she was married, oh, Dorothy Parker. She was a reporter for the New York Herald Tribune. She was one of the first American uh, reporters to, to write about what Hitler was doing to the Jews. Okay, but then after the war, she went to Palestine and she wrote about the displacement and the refugee situation in Palestine. And you know what? She lost her job. They fired her. So, um, you know, the American press has been, uh, you know, not not even handed when it's come to the Palestinians and the Israelis. Okay, so another sort of issue, I mean, you mentioned um, people maybe having the reaction to it being Arabs who are sort of the victims. Um, if you're comfortable, I would like to move and start talking about 9-11 and the impact of 9-11. Is that something you're comfortable talking about? Well, you know, the thing, I was totally against the war. I went with my twin sister, she's in New Jersey. She and I went to Washington and we marched. And there were hundreds of thousands of people. Of course, the press uh, did not report evenly. I mean, when I read anything, it was thousands. I mean, that mall was packed. Anyway, um, you know, I marched against the war. 9-11, uh, you know, I lived in Granville. <laughs> you know, I wasn't in New York, although uh, my brother lives in, in, in um, New York and uh, neighbors of his who worked in that um, building were killed. And my niece, my husband's niece, was going, she had an appointment in the, uh, in the tower. And as she was going in, the plane hit and she, you know, she ran out and it was, it, it affected her tremendously because she saw the horrors of, uh, you know, people falling out the windows. And I mean, it, it has affected her a lot that whole experience. Now, in terms of my being, um, you know, a Syrian Arab American, uh, I never, uh, you know, I, I didn't uh, experience anything. Um, did your, so you had, you experienced no difference in how you were treated. Did you hear of sort of family <laughs> members or friends who experienced sort of? No, no, because um, no, not at all, because we were a different, um, we were a different Arab American. We were, I guess, the good Arab Americans. We weren't uh, Muslim. We had been here for decades, maybe even a hundred years. So, and we, we, uh, you know, we were very Americanized. And how did it make you feel to see these um, Arab Americans being targeted. Oh, I felt terrible. I, I thought, you know, we're a racist society. Um, we can't, we, and actually, who, who was in, who was in those planes? It was Saudis and Egyptians. They, <laughs> they were the ones who did this 
um, awful deed, and they were our allies. And of course, W, George W says it's the Iraqis uh, behind it and weapons of mass destruction. And uh, no one thought, no one, not, not even the Congress uh, thought it out. It was like a rush to get into this terrible, terrible war, which has um, ha changed the complexion of the Middle East so drastically. Um, and here it was, the Saudis. And look, we're buddy-buddy now with the Saudis. And the Did you see a sort of change in sort of the American viewpoint? Could you speak to more of like what the general American um, people you were surrounded by thought of 9-11? Oh, they all agreed with me. You know, I, I, I was in Granville, a, um, a college town, you know, so it, maybe if I had lived in Jersey City, where there were a lot of Arab Americans, recent immigrants, I might have, you know, have had a different experience, but no, I didn't. And I think it's because we are from another generation of immigrant. Um, sort of finally to put a pin in this, was there, did you, was there a change in how you viewed yourself as an Arab American following 9-11? Um, did you feel more aware of yourself as Arab following this? Or I always it... felt aware. I always felt aware and I was always proud of my heritage and my culture. But I had, I, I, I was always afraid to admit when people, if people ask you what, you know, what's your ethnic background? And um, I would say Lebanese because it was neutral. Lebanese were neutral. If I said Syrians, Syrians were the bad guys. They were against Israel. I mean, even though Israel <laughs> took over the Golan Heights, has occupied it, has, you know. Um, but now, now, now because of this, well, no, I, I'll say I'm Syrian. And if people want to ask me, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest. But, you know, when I was younger, uh, I felt uncomfortable uh, admitting that my grandparents came from Syria. Why? Isn't what were you worried about the reaction being? Well, because the people, people looked upon Syria as an arch enemy of Israel. And if you're an arch enemy of Israel, you're anti-Semitic. And I'm not anti-Semitic. And people can't, you know, I have a sister-in-law who's Jewish. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I look at each person for who they are. And uh, I judge them and like them for, for who they are. If they're, um, and I always try to see the good in people. So moving forward into sort of, I guess, not even super recent, but the Arab Spring um, and the events surrounding that, is that something you were um, like hyper aware of? Did you see a difference in American perspectives of the Middle East following these sort of regime changes? Well, let me tell you a story. Um, you know, my husband taught French at Denison and we would go every few, six or seven years to France. And in 1990-91, we were in Paris. My husband was the executive, was the resident director of the Sweetbriar program. And we went into a Lebanese restaurant, started talking to the, the owner who was a, um, he was a reporter, a newspaper reporter. And I, get, I don't know why he left, but I am sure it was for political reasons. And we sat down and I met, uh, a uh, Syrian uh, who had just been released after 10 years in solitary confinement by Assad, okay? He was jailed by Assad because he was, this man was a reporter and he wrote against the Assad regime and they wanted to jail him and he escaped. But then he learned that if he didn't give himself up, he'd never see his wife or child. So he went 
back and gave himself up and was, um, was jailed in a cell where he couldn't even stand. And uh, he was, this was during 90, 91. And he said, God bless George Bush. He wished that George Bush would take out Assad. And uh, because he says they're the mafia. Of course they are. They are. It is a mafia. And you can't talk about, um, you know, uh, against the regime. Anyway, um, what, no, that leads into your question, which would you repeat the question why I told you this? Um, sort of the reaction to the Arab Spring and to okay. the uh, region. So I, I was really hoping that in Syria they'd get rid of Assad. I mean, he was just horrible. So you were um, pro-American intervention? No, no. Uh, uh, because look what we did in, in Iraq. Did we solve anything? <laughs> we, we've created chaos. We've created misery. We've created death and destruction. So, so why? But, um, you know, the Arab Spring was brought on by a lot of things. Um, you know, people coming from the farms because of global warming. They had, uh, they, they, they had um, droughts. And so uh, that caused a lot of ferment, uh, in, fo foment in the, in the cities. And I think that that's what caused the, the Syrians to, um, to, to, to want something better than what they were getting from the Assad regime. And did, you, obviously, so that's understandable. Did you see um, sort of the American depictions of the Assad regime and the Arab Spring as being in line with your own beliefs? Uh, you mean uh, the news media? Mm -hmm. And people, yeah. other people you spoke to? Yes, yeah, I did. Because I'm talking to well-educated people, um, yeah. No problem. But what would you say the reaction is for non sort of well-educated people? Uh, I don't think they even thought about it. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the non-educated people, well, that's happening over there. And, uh, you know, uh, you saw the reaction of, of having um, Syrian immigrants come in. I mean, people didn't want them. Uh, so they were they were limited, and so a lot of them went to um, Australia and Canada. Is that something that you're um, sort of aware of? The sort of the refugee crisis in the Middle East is that do you have? Oh, absolutely. That? Absolutely, but you know, I, uh, you know, I I'm a political person. I don't know if you knew this, but I was elected four times to the Granville Village Council. Um, my my aim there was to preserve to preserve the town, to preserve the land. Uh, I'm an environmental. Uh, I'm not an environmentalist. I'm very pro uh, saving the environment and whatever I could do. Uh, as a member of the council, um, I would do to, um, you know, keep keep developers from from destroying uh, the land. And um, I was on the company. I was part of the comprehensive plan. So, uh, you know, that's where I spent a lot of my political energy. Um, yeah, and, and of course, those talks about Palestine, those five talks that I gave. So I'm thinking it'd be interesting to sort of, as this is our final um, interview, mm -hmm. to sort of summarize the different stages of your life and your, um, like, how you viewed America in each of them, because the title of our project is sort of America as an Arab American narr narrator would see it, view it. Um, to check that um but so first of all if you sort of think about yourself as a child and how you viewed america and maybe american society specifically as an arab okay well 
uh, as a child, I viewed America through the lens of a child who was surrounded by this huge Arab American community where food was important, where gatherings, where cards were played, where cousins, uh, you know, played together. Okay. Um, then as, as I grew older, you know, I... Maybe as um, a young adult. Uh, as a young adult, I, I, I was very American. You know, I, I grew up in New York City. I thought of myself as this sophisticated uh, New Yorker. And, um, but not necessarily an Arab. Um, then I got married and we lived in North Carolina, very white bread, you know, uh, and then we moved to the Pittsburgh area, which has an Arab American community. And I did make friends with some uh, Arab Americans and uh, I, I had this one dear German friend. Um, we would go down to, they call it the strip. And there, were, there was this um, Middle East grocery store and she would love it that I would buy all these things and come back and cook and teach her how to make all sorts of, you know, like uh, hummus and baba ganoush and uh, uh, grape leaves and kibbe and um, this nesela and rice. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, we moved, uh, let's see, we moved to, um, to Granville, which was not quite as white bread as uh, Durham, North Carolina, but you know you couldn't you couldn't find a good i mean we lived there for 45 years there wasn't a good italian restaurant there was a so-so a chinese restaurant in newark um you know and to find a, a, a grocery that sold um you know arabic so i found it in um in columbus there was a big Arab American and mostly, I think, Palestinian uh, and Lebanese um, uh, community in uh, Columbus. And on High Street, there was a grocery store. Um, and I remember talking to the owner and I wanted to buy zatar, which it now is very in, you know, zatar, which is this spice. Um, he's telling me, it's very good for your heart. <laughs> so now I make sure I have Zeta around because it's good for your heart. Um, yeah, I was able to buy Syrian or as you called pita bread. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here in, in uh, Chicago, yeah, but it's not as good as the stuff from Brooklyn or Columbus. So I've been making my own. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, you know, and then I became really good friends with some Arab Americans at Denison. And, um, you know, I feel like family with, especially with Hanada, with Rana. Um, I mean, I, I feel like they're my family and I, I miss them very much. But now I'm here with my family, uh, my blood family. And, uh, you know, when I need some Arabic stuff, I go to this M Middle East grocery store, which isn't as good as the one in Columbus. So anyway, that's my story. Um, yeah, I, you know, I wanted to tell you a little bit you know my uh in my family uh, i have a cousin albert who worked for the united nations charles uh, that was albert masower charles isawi who is a scholar and uh, i don't know if you looked him up but he's my grandmother's cousin uh he was at the united nations as well as teaching at princeton and and columbia um, and has written many books. Uh, one of my um, 
mother's relatives. His daughter uh, uh, was a clerk for Sandra Day O'Connor. So, yeah. So, you know, my family has been involved in a lot of things. My brother, he fought, um, he was an environmental lawyer up in um, Buffalo. And um, you've, I don't know if you've heard about Love Canal. Well, there was another, well, it was terrible. It was so polluted and affecting the health of the people in the area. Well, there was another uh, toxic site there. And my brother worked on that and won, um, won the suit to, uh, for the people who were affected by this toxic dumping in, in Buffalo. So, you know, there's been a lot of awareness and politics and uh, all around in my family. Definitely. And, oh, Eric, you go ahead. Oh, well, just uh, speaking of awareness of politics with your family, uh, you'd mentioned, I believe, one of your relatives uh, having been uh, within the social circle of Khalil Gibran. Who, yes, uh, yes. My mother, well, my, my mother, um, her uncle, William, and his friend, um, I forgot his name, E.J. Audi. E.J. Audi owns a very, it's a very famous upscale um, furniture shop. So Uncle William and E.J. Audi, they lived in Greenwich Village. And every Sunday they would have brunch and invite all these intellectuals types. And my mother was invited to, to these brunches. And so she met Cahil Gibran. Um, she didn't talk too much about him, but I, I've read about him. He, and I, and I've, I've bought my kids, I bought them all the prophet because I think it's such a wonderful book of poetry. But he was, he was a, um, he had a lot of problems, Gail <laughs> Gibran, if you've read about him. But, you know, she was just proud that she met him, but she didn't talk about her experience there, just that she met him uh, well, at these brunches. Well, I, I only brought him up just because I know from reading about him that he was very invested in the situation in Lebanon where he had been yes. born. So after their immigration, was your family still very invested in you know, Syrian, Lebanese situation politics? Uh, my grandmother was, she would talk about it. But my parents, they weren't really very political. I mean, they were struggling with a business and five children. Um, yeah, I remember grandma reading about what was happening over there. She would get the Arabic newspapers and she would just go on and on how awful, uh, you know, the Israelis were or the French were or, and she, she read the New York Times every day. <laughs> this old lady, she was, she was, she was something. And she was a big influence on me. 